All right, <clears throat> let's go to our sermon time. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Romans and chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're going to read the first four verses there as we begin. Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, so follow along as I read. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David <clears throat> according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 16, Simon Peter told Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's, that was even before Christ's resurrection from the dead. The famous historian H.G. Wells was once asked which person had left the most permanent mark on human history. And his answer was that if one is judged by the accepted historical standards, then, quote, by this test, Jesus stands first. He said, the Galilean has proven too great for our small hearts. The influence and the effect of the Lord Jesus Christ on the world are much greater than anyone has ever fully calculated or assessed. Multitudes around the world are moved by him and the thought of him even to this day. Today is Sunday, the recognized day that Christians assemble for church services and worship. And so all around the world, depending on which time zone you're in, but all around the world, Jesus Christ is on the minds of people right at this moment. Uh, Flavius Josephus, he was a Jewish historian in the first century of the church. He wasn't even a believer, but he writes in a book called The Antiquities of the Jews, 93 AD, at that time there lived Jesus of Nazareth, a holy man, if man he may be called, for he performed wonderful works and taught men and joyfully received the truth, and he was followed by many Jews and many Greeks. He was Messiah. Unquote. To this day, there's no other name in history that evokes more love and for some people more hatred than the name of Jesus Christ. Our daily calendar is marked by his coming into the world. We say B.C., before Christ, A.D., which is Latin, Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. All of his life was only 33 and a half years long, and his public ministry, three and a half of those years. His life, his preaching, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection— still dominate the thinking and the inspiration and the hearts of men and women around the world today. And so I'm going to go back about five years and repeat a sermon, which I enjoy preaching. I don't know if you enjoy hearing it or not, but you're going to hear it anyway. And I call this, What's So Special About Jesus? What's so special about Jesus? Now, it might be hard for you to outline if you're taking notes, so don't worry about it today. First of all, let me ask, how is Jesus different from all other religious figures? That question's easily answered. Why don't the names uh, Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius uh, offend people the way the name of the Lord Jesus Christ does? Nobody ever hits their thumb with a hammer. Oh, Muhammad, blessings be upon him. They don't do that. But they sure use Jesus Christ's name without hesitation as a cuss word or a way of exclaiming their, their frustration. And could it be that none of those other names have any power or authority behind them and everybody instinctively knows it? Of course, that's our position. 
But let's examine it today. What makes Jesus different from all the religious leaders who have ever come or gone? And it's this. The Lord Jesus Christ claimed to be God in human form. None of those others did. No matter what their followers may have claimed centuries later. But Jesus Christ claimed to be God in the flesh. Um, this is what makes him different from other figures. And the New Testament clearly presents Jesus Christ as God. Jesus received honor and worship that only God should receive. In his confrontation with Satan, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 8, he said, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And yet Jesus received worship as God. And Matthew 14, verse 33, we read, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Matthew 28, verse 9, says, And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And other places in the Gospels, Matthew 20, Mark 5, and Luke chapter 24. And sometimes he even commanded that men should worship him as God. He said in John 5, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Earlier, earlier in John 5, he told the Jews, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal to God, there in John 5, verses 17 and 18. That is, they understood perfectly well the meaning of his words. They understood that he was putting himself on an equal par with God, that his activities were equal to God's activities. That's why they accused him of blasphemy. Uh, in fact, Jesus continually uh, spoke of himself as one uh, in nature and one in essence with the Heavenly Father. He boldly said, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. John 8, verse 19. He said, He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. John 12, 45. He told Philip, He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. John 14, verse 9. He that hateth me, hateth my Father also. John 15, verse 23. It's abundantly clear what Jesus was claiming about himself, and it's also clear that the Jews, at least the Jews of that day, understood perfectly well what his words implied. Even as he was being tortured and crucified, they stood at the foot of the cross, and uh, they said in Matthew 27, 43, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. They mocked him during his death because they understood his words perfectly well. And the distinct claims uh, of made by the Lord Jesus eliminate the idea that he was simply a good prophet or good moral teacher. He claimed to be much more than that. He claimed to be God in human form. Now, we have to decide if Jesus was telling us the truth or not. Was he God in the flesh or was he not? If Jesus claimed to be God and knew that he wasn't, uh, or he either claimed to be God and didn't know that he wasn't, he was mistaken. And we have to examine those two possibilities. If Jesus claimed to be God and knew that he wasn't, this makes him a liar. And not only a liar, it makes him a hypocrite. He expected men to be honest, and yet he himself was being dishonest. And I'm borrowing the outline put forth by C.S. Lewis in his book, Lord, Liar, or Lunatic. Uh, Michael Medved, a conservative Jew I listen to quite a bit on the radio, he said this is still one of the most formidable arguments put forth by Christians. So pay attention to what I have to give you today. But how could a liar conceive of and carry out and maintain the most noble and virtuous and exemplary life ever lived. 
without it falling apart and coming unraveled eventually. Consider that Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Catholics and Lutherans, even Seventh-day Adventists, and maybe a few other denominations, they may disagree with each other and they may argue with and debate with each other about the interpretation of Scripture, but the person of Jesus Christ inspires all of them in some way to do something in his name, to build hospitals, to uh, ostensibly uh, erect universities in the name of Jesus Christ. Think of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, the Ivy League schools, uh, and Dartmouth, and USC was founded by Methodists. UC Berkeley, the armpit of universities in America, was founded by the Presby First Presbyterian Church of San Francisco, its pastor serving as the college's first president. And all of the Ivy League schools were founded by the Church of England and Presbyterians to teach ministers, to train missionaries or Christian lay workers, to, do, go, to go out and propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you wouldn't find the gospel respected at those places now, but along with those, think of Cambridge and Oxford in England going 900 years, 1,000 years before them. I would dare say that skeptics and atheists wouldn't know what higher education was if the Christian church hadn't given it to them in some form. The, the logo, check out the logo uh, and the motto for the University of California system. It still says, let there be light. Hello, Genesis 1. The Latin motto for uh, Dartmouth is still vox clamantis in deserto, a voice, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Hello, John the Baptist. That's why I say uh, the, un the unbelieving, the secular world, they wouldn't know what higher education was if Christians hadn't uh, supplied it to them many years ago. Where are the great, noteworthy, and... Um, world-famous Muslim hospitals? Where are the famous and world-famous Hindu hospitals? Where are the famous Buddhist hospitals? They don't exist. But the person of Jesus Christ inspires people to achieve great things or to do great things. I think it was, um, I want to say Hudson Taylor, I may be wrong, He's, or William Carey, he said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And the Lord Jesus Christ inspires people to attempt great things in the name of God. Albert Einstein said in a magazine interview with Saturday Evening Post back in 1929, I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. You simply cannot deny Jesus as a deliberate liar. Well, secondly, what if Jesus claimed to be God, but he was mistaken? He really thought he was, but he was self-deluded in some way. This wouldn't make him a liar, but it would make him a lunatic someone in need of his own mental help. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. It's impossible, however, to think that Jesus Christ could have been a crazy man or a lunatic. He spoke some of the most gracious and loving and compassionate words that have ever been spoken in the history of the world. After he read the scriptures in the synagogue, the Bible says, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Luke 4, verse 22. The Jews sent officers to arrest Jesus, and they came back empty-handed. And when they asked him, why have you not brought him? They said, never man spake like this man. John 8, 46. In John 6, Jesus asked his disciples that they would all forsake him. Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, there in John 6, verse 68. His Sermon on the Mount, 
Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes, blessed are the uh, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, and so on, is probably the most famous sermon ever preached in the history of man. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus cast out unclean spirits and devils out of a man who was running around the graveyard naked and cutting himself. And when the town folk heard about it, they came to see, and the Bible says they found the man, quote, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Luke 8, verse 35. His words have freed men from their mental bondage. He wasn't a lunatic. He wasn't a crazy man. The Greek word for soul is pronounced suke. It's, in English, it's spelled P-S-Y-C-H-E. Or we call it psyche. Look up the word psyche in any good English dictionary. The very first definition is the word soul. The word psyche means soul. Psychology properly means the study of the soul. Psychiatry, the treatment of the soul. Man's greatest need in life is not just mental. It's not physical. It's not emotional. I want to fall in love. It's not financial. Man's greatest need is spiritual. Jesus told Nicodemus, he must be born again. Have you been born again? I'm glad I was born again as a young boy. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, your psyche. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. There's a psychologist named uh, J.T. Fisher, excuse me, and he wrote back in 1952, for nearly 2,000 years, the Christian world has been holding in its hands the complete answer to its restless and fruitless yearnings. Here rests the blueprint for successful human life with optimism, mental health, and contentment. That's hardly the legacy of a lunatic. Fourthly, let me say, if Jesus wasn't a liar and he wasn't a lunatic, was he the Lord God of heaven? There are only so many possibilities. The Apostle Paul began as a very zealous uh, and enthusiastic uh, religious persecutor, an anti-Christian. The Bible tells us in Acts 8, verse 3, that he, quote, made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women. And then it says he committed them to prison. But after his own conversion... To the Lord Jesus Christ and near the end of his life he writes to his disciple Timothy and he says without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles believed on in the world and lastly received up into glory first Timothy 3 16 that was quite a revelation to come to by a man who uh, began trying to destroy the faith which now he preached. And he went to his death believing in. And he concluded that, yes, Jesus Christ was in fact God in human form, living among men, walking among men, to uh, identify himself with men, facing the same weaknesses of human flesh, facing temptations like as men are tempted, yet unlike men, never yielding to temptation and being victorious over temptation and sin. So he lived a perfect life that men cannot live. If Jesus Christ was truly God manifest in the flesh, then it means your eternal destiny will depend upon what you do with him. What you do with him. You can either trust and receive him as your savior or, or you can reject him. But you can't remain indifferent. There is no in-between. A little bit of here, a little bit there. You have to make a decision. I will either trust him or I won't trust him. 
To not trust him is the same as deciding not to trust him. Refusing, rather. If he was the Lord of heaven, then you must reconcile yourself to him before it's too late. The Bible says, and this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The verses I, I probably quote more than any other, 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12. Jesus Christ is the hinge on which all of human history turns, and he's the hope on which your eternity must depend someday. Next, some people may still refuse Jesus Christ, claiming that the miracles that are reported to have been done by him can't be verified or proven by any scientific method. And so they think they're playing it safe by not committing themselves to Jesus Christ. But the scientific method is based upon uh, experimentation. You have controlled a controlled circum environment, and you can perform experiments to either prove or disprove a theory or, or a hypothesis. And by the scientific method, none of us could prove that we are here today. We don't have a time machine to, to con go contrary to the time and space continuum, right? Like Star Trek always refers to. We don't have a time machine to take us back two hours ago and to see if the same people keep showing up repeatedly. So, but by testimonial evidence, we might be able to establish that we were all here. I see you here. The person next to you sees you. Perhaps you're taking notes, and you've got today's date written on the piece of paper. Much as a lawyer presenting a case in a courtroom by testimonial proof. That's how we need to uh, argue for the accuracy and the authority of the Bible and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by its testimonies. Someone might say, well, can the testimonies be believed? Are they accurate? Is the New Testament telling us the truth? As Christians, we don't abandon our mental faculties, our abilities to think and reason uh, to become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I would submit that as a believer, the more you read the scriptures, trusting the Holy Spirit to enlighten your understanding, your mind expands. You come up with unbelievable questions that have never been asked before. You think, you think things that haven't been thunk before. And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Matthew 22, verse 37. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God. But if the thing you're studying is flawed and false, then you're going to be heading down the wrong road. Aristotle died 322 B.C. The oldest records we have of his writings are dated at 900 A.D., nearly 1,200 years after the man died. And nobody disputes them. They all say, well, those are reliable. Caesar wrote about Roman warfare, 50 B.C. The oldest records we have of his writings go back to 1100 A.D. 1,200 years after the fact, nobody questions the accuracy of those. When it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, however, people say, well, you can't trust what was written about him. You, you know something? The, the Buddha supposedly died about more or less 500 B.C. The first official biography about him wasn't written until 100 A.D., 600 years, give or take, after his supposed lifetime. That's a lot of time for a lot of legend and mythology to have been created and crept in to the story. We have documents or manuscripts of the Gospel of John going back to 130 A.D., within 35 years of the writer himself, the Apostle John, the last disciple to die. And people say, well, you can't trust that. Are you kidding me? 
that's probably one of the most, the, the New Testament is one of the most sound and dependable and accurate and authoritative and reliable documents of ancient history. Now, I'm going to begin to wind this down a little bit here. Jesus wasn't a liar. Jesus wasn't a lunatic. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ was the Lord God of heaven in human form. And we also believe his testimonies can be true or can be trusted. So what's so special about Jesus? The Lord Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them, John 10, verses 7 and 8. He's superior to all others, just like, well, this might seem a little crass, but just like flush toilets are superior to outhouses. He's superior to all the others, just like electric lights are far superior to candles. If you had indoor plumbing and you had electric lights, why would you want to go back and live out in you know, the country with no water, using an outhouse, lighting candles every night? Who wants to go back to that? Let me ask you, would you be willing to trust him if you don't know him as your savior? There may be people watching by the internet. Let me ask you, would you be willing to trust him? Are you able to confess and admit to God that you're a sinner who needs to be forgiven by God? Simply admitting your fault is the first step to getting help. You need to admit that you're a sinner, you need the forgiveness of God, and you trust that only Jesus Christ is able and qualified to be your savior. He suffered for your sake. He died on your behalf. He took the judgment for your sins that you should have received even before you were even born. I've never seen where they put the nails in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor have I ever seen where they nailed uh, his feet. My father uses this illustration very often. I've never seen where the soldier thrust the spear in Christ's side. But I believe in my heart that one day, long before I was ever born, the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross of Mount Calvary, suffering for the sins that I would one day commit, being judged beforehand on my behalf, being judged by God for the sins that I would be guilty of one day, and uh, offering forgiveness and cleansing if I would simply trust in him. If I would admit to God I'm a sinner, and I know I can't save myself, but I'm going to trust God to forgive me and save me. God wants to do that for every sinner. God wants to do that for you if you're watching on the internet. God wants to do that for everybody here uh, under the sound of my voice today.